simplification uh, is just that we um, we want to take the two bodies of the predicates and we want to zip them together and compare them element by element, combining those as we go along. Uh, so honestly, the slides are kind of uh, messed up. So I think I'm going to be, use the, the whiteboard um, just to go through unification. Uh, I mean, you can everybody see the, mm -hmm. the whiteboard? Okay. Uh, and so really, the core idea, uh, thanks. Uh, is that, so now we have two predicates, right, which are completely compatible. So we might have foo of x, a, b, and we might have bar of, let's say, b, y, x, right? Or, sorry, <laughs> foo. So these two, so we've passed the first two checks, which say that they have the same name, they have the same number of arguments. Uh, so the next step in, in unifying is that we just want to zip over the list of body elements uh, and then we want to compare each one. Uh, and so, again, uh, what we're working with are uh, maybe MGUs, right? And so maybe forms a monad. Um, uh, is everybody familiar with how maybe works here? Like the maybe monad? Okay. Uh, and so the nice thing about using a monad is that we get a lot of reusable functions. And in particular, what we want to do is we want to go through it. We want to unify uh, all these subparts, but at, at each step, the unification sort of may or may not fail. And if any one of these fails to unify, we want the whole thing to fail. And handily, we can do this by using full dem with maybe. So what this happens is that this basically does a fold and as it goes along, instead of having a normal accumulator, it accumulates a maybe value. And as soon as it hits nothing, the entire result of full dem is nothing. So this gives us a nice termination for the uh, unification. And so what, what we do at this point is we zip these two together, and then we just fold um, on all the pairs. Okay. And then so now what we have is we have a bunch of cases. Uh, one case is if we're matching a variable x against anything. It, it could be something arbitrarily complex. It could be bar a, b, y, you know, whatever. And, well, we know we have a variable here. We have a term. And we can just assign the, the, the term to the variable. So in this case, we just return the MGU, which says x equals this thing. And, you know, we return just that. So that's an easy case. Um, then we have the, the mirror case, where we would have bar, you know, whatever here, and we just have a variable. And again, same thing, uh, we can just return a mapping of assigning y to that. Um, and then the other interesting case would be, uh, what, what happens if we, we have two predicates, like bar x, a, b, and then, um, you know, bar, so on. Uh, so in this case, as you can see, we're sort of back to where we started originally, but sort of nested down a level. Um, and so here in this case, we just unify these two, right? And then combine them, we, we merge them with the uh, MGU we, we're, we're folding on, right? And again, if this one fails, then the entire merge, you know, since it's mapped over a maybe, it's gonna return to nothing. Um, and so that's actually a, a quick aside about the MGU. So we, we have our MGU type, right? And what we also want is a way to take two different MGUs. So we have a bunch of assignments for some variables, a bunch for others, and we want to combine them, right? Uh, and the way this basically works uh, is that we, uh, we take um, all of the, the, basically we take all the terms that are assigned on the left-hand side um, from, from the left-hand MGU, and we use it to, sub, so if we have two mappings, one of which maps x to, to, to something, and one of which maps y to something, uh, then, uh, well, so at least um, in my code, I sort of cheated a little bit. I set it up so that whenever I use this merging function, um, the left-hand one is always guaranteed to not contain any variables from the right-hand one, right? Uh, and so given this invariant, what we can do is we can simply merge these and it's guaranteed to succeed by taking all of the terms here, right, 
and just replacing uh, and just sort of applying the MGU to them. So if y is defined to have a term which contains x, right, then when we're merging, the first thing I would do is I would take this term and replace all occurrences of x with whatever it's defined to be. Right? And then after that, you can just concatenate the two to get this larger MGU, which is sort of a consistent view of both of these mappings. So that, I, I think that might have been confusing. So does that, can, can you follow that? Right? And this is sort of, the idea is basically to uh, update our view of the world to contain information from both. But to, to, to avoid potential edge cases, um, we just have it set up in the algorithm so it never comes up that, for example, x might be defined to y or something. Um, Where are the two coming from? Just are they? Oh, so, so I sorry. This is a, in this case, it's a bit of an aside. This is just an operation you can do on MGUs. Oh, okay. And uh, going so go, going back to where we were in the unification, right? Let's say we, we have two subterms, which are both bars, right? And so we've unified these. So we get a, an MGU out of this one, and then we already have uh, an MGU that we've been working on so far. So we've gone through the expression. We, we've combined a bunch of other pairs. We're here, we have an old one, we have this new one, and we, we basically just mer merge those two. So, you know, if, if you take the old one, and it, it, it just works out that in, in this case, um, you're guaranteed not to have any overlap. So you can always put the resulting MGU from here on the left-hand side of the merge. And in reality, we, we just take this and we map the merge function over this because it's a maybe value, right? And that, that takes care of our plumbing. So that's the, the, the recursive case. So uh, for unification, the recursion is fairly direct, but it has to go through this extra layer of maybe. Um, and then the, the, the final case is basically uh, a check. So we've gone through a case. If you've seen a variable on the left-hand side, we've de dealt with it. If you've seen a variable on the right-hand side, we've dealt with that. If we've seen two predicates, we've dealt with that. But now we have uh, a bunch of other possible cases that involve atoms, right? But really, there's not much. Uh, there's not really much to do with an atom, right? The only thing you can do with it is compare for equality. And basically, if we've ever, if we made it all the way down here, uh, the cases, you know, we have an A and a B, and we, we don't know what they are. If they're equal, right? If, 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 if they're the same, then it means that we can match. But we don't really gain any new information. Um, we don't gain any new variable assignments because there aren't any variables. And so in that case, we just return just whatever we're working on. On the other hand, if these are not equal, if they're two different atoms, it just means we fail outright. Um, and if it's like an atom and a predicate, which is another possible case we haven't considered, we still fail outright. So this last catch-all case gets everything. Um, so, so far, that's, uh, I think, pretty reasonable. But one problem uh, I sort of glossed over is the possibility that, well, what if we were going along and we saw an x on the left-hand side and, like, cons, you know, x, nil on the right-hand side, right? So that if you actually had this definition of x equals cons x, nil, then uh, sort of this implicitly defines x to be this infinite structure, right? So in theory, you could actually solve this equation and say, well, okay, x is just an infinitely nested list. Right? But in practice, this is really no good for actual programming. So uh, to disallow these sort of potential infinite cases, we have to add an extra check. So now, in reality, when we have the case of a variable and something, we only do the assignment if something does not contain the variable. Right? We check if the variable does not occur in whatever we're assigning to it. Um, coincidentally, this is called the occurs check. Um, and if you've ever uh, played around with, uh, with Haskell and written an expression like, you know, let x equal the list of x, right, the error message actually goes out and tells you, ooh, you know, the, the occurs check failed. Um, and unless you're, you know, unless you're familiar with logic programming, it's kind of this completely cryptic thing to say, right? Uh, but this is where it comes from. It's saying that it tried to solve for the type variable of t, right? And it, it had a unified t with list of t. Um, and since list of t contains t, it fails the occurs check, and it can't type check. Um, a, a, as a cute aside, though, if, you've ever u, uh, if you're using OCaml, there is actually a tag that supports recursive types like this. So if you ever wanted to play around 
with um, regressive types, you could try OCaml and just pass in the, the, the dash rec types uh, flag when you're running it. But uh, the reason it's behind the flag is because, uh, on the one hand, it's completely sound, and it makes far more programs type check, but 99% of the programs that do type check under this uh, should have been wrong. And so in practice, it is horribly counterproductive to use this for real programming. Um, so it's not a big loss that Haskell doesn't have this. Um, of course, the other thing is that in Haskell, you can get away with uh, supporting recursive types explicitly um, just by de de defining a new type <coughs> that wraps up the recursion in constructors. And so that way, the recursion isn't implicit anymore, and you could work with it. So if you wanted to work with the type of infinitely nested list, well, you could start by saying, you know, rec f equals rec, uh, I'm running out of space, equals, you know, rec uh, f of rec f, or something. Uh, and so this would allow you to come up with the type of, like, infinitely nested lists, but you can't really do anything with it, so that was not terribly interesting. Uh, but he also, just for sort of future reference, this type is actually often called fix. And so if you ever sort of encounter people talking about fixed points of functors, uh, they're just talking about how to make uh, the, a potentially recursive type exclusively recursive so that it works in Haskell. Um, right, so that, uh, that covers unification. Uh, yeah? So just to like recap in my head, so if you have like foo x a right and foo b y, you, you end up with x is a and y is, I mean x is b and y is a, right? Exactly, yes. Okay. So when you're unifying, yeah. That's um, like the result. Yeah, exactly. So the, the result of unifying these two would be just the mapping which says x equals b, y equals a. Okay. Right. Um, now, so this unification algorithm uh, is actually quite interesting to Haskellers because that's how type variables work. Um, and in, in fact, if you think about uh, sort of, if, if you have a function that takes, you know, a t of t int, you know, list or something, right? Um, really, it's kind of like uh, a prolog. Uh, Prolog set, set of predicates, which might be like t uh, list pair t int, right? And so later, when you're trying to combine this with something, uh, if you try to pass into this argument just to play int, for example, right, it's going to fail, and it fails just because of our old unification check, where it gets to the end and sees, well, this is an atom, this isn't, it fails. And on the other hand, if you know you actually pass in a valid type, then it will look something like, for example, list pair I don't know, double int. And if you actually go through the unification algorithm, you'll see that it assigns t to double and it matches. And this is exactly what happens when you pass in some argument of some type into uh, a, t a function that expects a type variable. So unification um, at the type level is just how type variables are assigned to specific, specific types. Um, so that's kind of one of the first places where ideas from Prolog start to be relevant to functional programming. And actually, I think just going through at some point and implementing unification yourself is, going to, is a good exercise just to get used to thinking about type variables. Um, right, and so the, the other thing in, in Prolog is the actual search mechanism, which is usually called resolution, right? And the, the idea is that we have a bunch of facts in the database, right? And these are a, a bunch of rules which might have their own dependencies and so on. Uh, and then when we do a query against them, so we, we ask them like b of x or something. Uh, I mean, fundamentally, the, the idea is that it would go through, it would see that b matches this constructor, so it would go into the body, the, the conditions. Then, inside the body, it has a whole bunch of predicates. And so now, all of a sudden, it just recurses back to saying, well, I have this predicate. Now I'm going to try to solve, solve for it at the top. So it goes through, and it just 
takes the same universe, but now applies a new query to it, right? Um, tries to solve that, and then one, you know, once it solves that, it goes on to the next condition in the body. Um, and then it, it, at some point, if something like if something fails, it just backtracks. So fundamentally, the prolog model is a search through all these conditions, which just uh, keeps on backtracking. Uh, and so, uh, I'm not going to go through the, the whole resolution algorithm, um, but uh, I'll point out the sort of core structure that we have in Haskell for it, where, the, as I said, the, the, the main idea is, is, is a backtracking search, right? And the way to think about backtracking in Haskell, oddly enough, is to use lists. And in particular, this is what the, uh, the list monad does. Uh, so is everybody here familiar with it, or less so? Uh, I mean, like a few people talked about it yesterday in the, the talks about uh, pipes, for example. Uh, but basically, once you start thinking about lists, then it turns out that the whole prolog search ends up being very elegant to state as a fold m, fold m, where the accumulator, the intermediate thing, instead of being a single value, is a list of values. So as the fold is going along, it can either you know grow more possibilities, or if it you know hits. Um, branches that it can't solve anymore, it gets 